Hi, I'm Stephanie Bass. And I'm Donald Montgomery. And you're in mixed company. and welcome to In Mixed Company, a podcast discussing mixed race identity and discussing the politics of race constructively in mixed racial racial company. On the podcast today, another experienced episode, what I like to call the train station incident and what is a hate crime. And this is in the Canadian context. Yeah. So Donald's with me today. Hi, Don. Hi, Steph. How you doing? Mm, Good. This is going to be a hard one for me. Yeah, I know. It's going to be hard for me, too, because I remember this one. Um, So this is a quick trigger warning. This episode does involve me describing a fairly violent act. So um, that's just a little shout out in case you need to go past. I'll make sure that I add a chapter for people that want to go past the description just to the talk about the criminal code and stuff like that. Yeah, and specifically, this is a a violent act that was... uh, perpetrated on you yeah so so there's a warning a little bit of a trigger warning for people yep all right let's get into it i guess okay so from the title you can tell that something happened in a train station yeah subway toronto it wasn't the subway actually it was the actual train station oh oh like union yeah so the the go the main go hub yeah so the, the main train station in toronto wow so it was a busy one, too, because it was rush hour. Yeah, so you're talking like hundreds of people. Yeah. All right. So not an easy story for me to recount, um, but it was, I don't know, eight years ago now. So 2010. Yeah. So I uh, enough time has passed that I can sort of share. Um, I was in the train station in the morning because I took the train to work to get to Toronto. And I guess it was about 8 o'clock in the morning. I'll try not to put in too many details. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning, and there was um, this little old black lady who was a Jehovah's Witness, and she was selling Watchtower magazines. I remember her because she kind of looked like my grandmother. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, she really was minding her own business, and these three... um, I'm also going to try not to swear. These three young white men <laughs> were harassing her really badly actually and um calling her names and yelling at her and hitting the magazine out of her hand i remember that and um people were just walking by and nobody said anything and i was getting irate and so i stepped up and said you need to back off why don't you just go on your way she's not bugging anybody and um, the, th- the three guys basically told me that I needed to mind my own business. But they didn't use such nice words. <laughs> yeah. And um, I stood in front of the woman and said, no, back off. And um, they took that as a challenge, I guess, and decided that they were going to teach me a lesson for sticking my nose <laughs> for being a nosy n-word and sticking my nose where it didn't belong and um i got punched across the face um i got hit in the neck um and i grabbed my backpack to sort of shield me and then one of them kicked me in the leg and i went down and somebody kicked me in the stomach um and it was just enough time for them to get a few hits in before they took off, right? Before they sort of dispersed into the crowd. And I don't know where they went. And so I got up and made sure that the little old lady was okay. And she's like, am I okay? And I was like, yeah, are you okay? Because, I mean, what else do you do? Right. Um, and she was fine. And, uh, which is funny, because neither of us, we looked at each other, but neither of us said, oh, we should get the police that wasn't something that came out of our mouths which thinking in retrospect is kind of funny um but after she was okay um she's like i'm gonna go call my grandson and so i took her to the payphone and she called her grandson and then she stood by the ticket booth and then after she was okay i took the subway to go to work and i was good 
on the subway. Like I just like acted like nothing happened. I had my bag. I remember I put my head down. Um, and then I got to work and I fell apart. <laughs> I remember I went up to my boss and then I dropped my bag and I started crying. And she's like, oh my God, what's wrong? And these kids have just beat me up in the train station. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, I want to go back. So, so number one, in the, like in the train station when when you first saw them, it was it was clear that they were skinheads. They were wearing. Well, yeah, they had the like no hair and leather jackets with the like Nazi symbols on it. Yeah, so they were overt. And Doc Martens with the white laces. They had everything I was looking for that I would usually avoid in a person. Right. Um, but I was really angry because they were harassing this woman and nobody would stop. And this, there are thousands of people. I would go past hundreds, thousands of people in the train station at this time. And they just heads down, just keep walking. And the same thing when I was getting hit, nobody, I heard nobody say, Hey, stop that. Yeah. But what I did hear when I was going to the subway with people talking about me and how I shouldn't have stuck my nose in. Right. That was not my business. So um, people who had seen what had happened and then were sort of commented. commented. Which is why I was like, sort of had my head down, hunkered down in the subway yeah. to just get to work, right? Right. Um, but I, I was very frustrated with the fact that nobody helped that old woman and then that nobody helped me. Like... Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that this wasn't, like, this is, a, uh, you know, this is the biggest metropolitan area in Canada. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 2010, so yeah, sure, eight years ago, but I mean, smartphones were still a thing back then. Mm-hmm. Were, I had one. Yeah, everybody had cameras, everybody had phones, everybody had, like, the technology that w- you would need to at least, you know. But they don't even need that. They just need sheer numbers. Just yeah. two people say, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, Yeah. But, I mean, not, not, nobody even bothered to, like, sort of stop and, like, document what was happening, no. even if they were scared of stepping in. They just, everybody walked by. And then, in addition to that, like, there was no help. I mean, you know, that train station's full of cameras. Mm-hmm. So, he was... But it was... And we'll get to that after, when I talk to right. the police, begrudgingly. Yeah. Talk to the police about it. Um, they were so... Like, it was so easy for them just to disappear. Yeah. Right? That, like, they all just split up. That even I couldn't find them. Like, yeah. I was like, oh, I better get on the subway then. Like, because I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> um, I was kind of in shock, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I went, I went to work. <laughs> and then once I was in a place that was not really safe, but safer than... <laughs> train station where everybody's watching me get my ass kicked um i i was able to just be like yeah upset yeah and that's that's kind of when you called me and this is going to lead into the next part because when when you when you called me and you told me what had happened and i sort of was processing that and going through my reaction you know white male thinking oh you need to call the cops <laughs> And, like, and a part of me knew that, but I was like, oh, God. And, like, this is just one of those things, right, where for me, you know, because of my interactions over the course of my lifetime. They've been positive, they've right? They've been very positive interactions. I've Like, you've seen how I interact with the police. Yeah. It, it confuses you. I was like, well, he's nice to him. Yeah. And also, like... I just kind of saunter up. Hey, guys, how's it going? Well, my first instinct isn't to call the police because... Yeah. Well, again, you've had negative interactions. Yeah. So... I mean, I knew I had to. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't looking forward to that part. You're like, you need to call the police. I go, I know. Yeah. Um, I did call the police afterwards, and they were not much help. 
Well, you didn't just call the police. You called the hate crimes unit of the Toronto Police Department. And Well, I tried to call that. I tried to get transferred to them. And okay. so it's always just the same person that takes the information. And they're like, can you come down here? And I was like, no, I'm working. <laughs> like, yeah. And so I was trying to explain what happened. And they're like, did you get a good look at the guys? And I gave them a description, which was fairly vague because I was getting beat up. Yeah. And um, they're like, well, do you know of any witnesses? I go, well, there are probably a thousand witnesses. Yeah. Um, and they were very little help. Well, why did they attack you? Why did you step in? They, like, just all these different basically questions that I felt were kind of irrelevant. I was like, well, because they were harassing this older lady and somebody needed to do something. Why did that have to be you? Because it was nobody else. Yeah. Didn't you think that was a dangerous situation? Obviously, I did not. <laughs> I did not go to work that morning thinking, hey, going to get beat up by some kids, skinheads today. Well, And so the questions that they asked, they're like, well, I don't know what we can do about this. Yeah. You know what? I, I It's actually crystallized in my memory. Mm-hmm. You know, that the specific words you said that day and this is something that sort of stayed with me the whole time is that they actually said there's not a lot we can do about that yeah and i mean this is didn't they, i just say that no you said well we can't really help you or whatever but oh yeah the, the, sorry I sorry I, yeah <laughs> paraphrasing so but the reason it crystallized in my mind is because like i'm not an investigator mm-hmm but I knew there were cameras. I, I knew, knew there were was, cameras. Everybody knows there's cameras. And I had two friends that were like highfalutin lawyers. And they're like, here's what you're going to do. And yeah. I was like, I'm not going to do anything because even the police won't help me. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to, if I see it, would I do it again? Probably. <laughs> well, here's the thing. You, you knew it was a dangerous situation. You're not, you're not stupid. You no, knew. I just didn't think it was going to be that bad. I thought they were going to be like... They were going to yell. And, yeah, they were going to scream and call me the N-word, oh, boo-hoo, and then yeah. leave, right? Um, more than that, I thought somebody else would stop. <laughs> yeah. Right? And... Yeah, as, as part of the commuter crowd, like, in Toronto, I didn't realize it at the time when I was, um, you know, working in a different city. Mm-hmm. But now that I'm part of the commuter crowd, going to Toronto every day... Um, I, I definitely understand like the flow of people and the fact that people will literally walk past pretty much anything. They will, they don't care. Yeah. And that's kind and I of think disappointing. That's a sad state though. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like, so anyways, so I, I called the police and they were like, well, I don't know what we can do about that. Um, which was frustrating. Um, because it was so obviously a racially motivated crime. And they were like, well, you can't, you can't assume that. Well, didn't you say something that... Pretty much assume it. I remember, like, when we were talking at the time, didn't you say something about how the police sort of suggested that you had instigated it? That's what I said. They were, like, asking me these questions, like, why did you get involved? And was it yeah. your business, really? And... Um, the questions made it felt like they're like, you should have butt out. Yeah. It, it's, Parker, like it's more of the, more of the sort of victim the, blaming. Yeah. Right? Like, it's your fault. You shouldn't have done that. And so, and so I was just like, I don't know. It wasn't a great day at work. Um, but I had already commuted two and a half hours to get there. Mm-hmm. So I was going to put my day in at work with my bruised side and sore jaw. Yeah, well, your jaw actually might have been cracked because you hurt for a good week or two after that. And so... Like, I remember that. And then I remember when I finally felt okay enough to post, um, you know, sort of the the bare bones story on Facebook. I remember my friends, my quote unquote friends responses. And that just made me even madder because a bulk of them were like, I can't believe that. I can't believe that happened. This is Canada. Um, which didn't re-victimize me, but I hate, I hated the fact that at first, like 
it was my boss and then it was the police and then it was this and then it was my own friends on Facebook. Yeah. And I was like, yes, this really happened. I showed you the bo- my body. Like, I showed you the proof. Yeah. Um, no one wants to believe that this but, kind of thing happens. Yeah. Well, this doesn't happen. This is Canada. And I was like, oh, I never got beat up by skinheads in the South. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, um, so I was, I was, I was angry again. Like I got re-incensed after trying to tell my story. And so for a long time, I just sat on it. I didn't really talk about it. Yeah. Well, I know that you've struggled with the, like the implications of that, especially the fact that there were so many people who, who sit back when they see something like that happen and don't step up and say no. I like to think now more people do get involved. I don't know. Because we have those videos and we have yeah. the reporting and stuff like that that's increasing. But but at the same time, though, you've also been in situations where there have been people who've said things and done things to you and you, like recently this year. and Yeah, I'm lucky. I get all the people that don't want to get involved. And then they just, they just kind of, oh, that's not my, you know, and they just yeah. kind of shuffle on, pretend they didn't hear, pretend they didn't see or whatever. And that's really sort of, in my mind, you know, if you want to be an ally, you can't just walk by. No. I mean, and there's things to, there's things that you can do if you don't feel safe in that moment. Do I expect, did I expect anybody to jump in and help me fight off the skinheads? No. Yeah. Did I expect somebody to maybe get security? Yeah, I did expect that. Or did I expect somebody or a group of people to start shouting? Yeah. I did. But that didn't happen. And I I still like even after such a long time, I still don't really know how to take that, right? Like because I'm so obviously not that person that just stands by. Yeah. Right? Well, one of the one I'm of the... like as soon as they knocked that watchtower out of that lady's hands, I was like, I'm in. Yeah. Well, one of the weaknesses of sort of the Canadian stereotype is the idea that we're oh so polite. The 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 the, the other side of that is is that we don't like confrontation, and we're oh, afraid. Oh, but you're of, so obviously on the right side if you're like skinheads and you're like, hey, I got your picture, skinheads, or whatever you want to say to get them to go away. Yeah. Right. Like. Again, it's I don't know. I've I I I've, now I've, I didn't jump in to be the hero. I honestly didn't think they were going to punch me. Like, I didn't think that was the ending. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't think the ending was, oh, we're going to punch this chick. Yeah. I thought they would shout a few things and honestly disappear. Yeah. Because that's happened before, right? Not these ones. (laughs) No. Um, And so... The reason why I think I'm, I'm, I wanted to talk about this on the podcast, though, is because I wanted to talk about a bigger problem that we have in Canada, and that's with the definition and reporting of hate crimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the second half of this podcast is called, you know, what's a hate crime? And unfortunately, in Canada, there's not really a definition yeah, of a hate crime. It's not in the criminal code. Not as quote unquote uh, like hate crimes. Yeah. That's not a section of the criminal code in Canada. Yeah. Um which is a problem because if I say hate crime, most people can imagine what that means, right? Yeah. But it's not defined in the criminal code. Well, and and most police services across the country have hate crime divisions. Yeah, which is a problem because it's not actually outlined in the criminal code as such. So what do they do? Yeah, what authorization, what sort of, what charges can they bring? If there's no, if there's no section under the criminal code in Canada that says this person's breaking the law if they do this, Mm -hmm. there is no charge that can be laid against a person. There is no crime a person can commit. Now, there are related sections we'll get into later, Mm -hmm. but ultimately... If you don't have a definition of hate crime, there's no such thing. And then, you know, you get this kind of hodgepodge of of other little 
tidbits that have to be mm-hmm. melded together. So this lawyer, Mark Freeman, who has been quoted in a news story, which I will link on the blog, he had outlined that what many people refer to as hate crimes are actually cases where judges have taken a guilty person's hateful motivations into account during sentencing. And that's where people get the idea that this is a hate crime. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, the criminal code does indicate that uh, if an offense was motivated by bias, prejudice, or hate based on race, national, or ethnic origin, language, color, religion, sex, age, mental or physical disability, sexual orientation, or any other similar factor, then that will be taken into account. For sentencing, right? Yeah. So... Overall, like the idea of like a quote unquote hate crime is not something somebody can be charged with. Yeah. The police are never going to charge somebody with a quote unquote hate crime. So like uh, I have an example, like if somebody's drawing swastikas, they could be charged with mischief or they could be charged with vandalism. Yeah. But they wouldn't be charged with a hate crime, even though it's so obviously motivated yeah. by hate, right? Um, but the criminal code does talk to what some people call hate crimes, but it's kind of, it's very narrow, Yeah. the definitions that are outlined in the three sections of the criminal code. Um, and more than that, the sections that have to do with hate crimes, quote unquote, are not really used yeah. very often. Yeah. The, the, the... One of them never. Yeah, so so there are no... Which, which section is it where there are no recorded criminal convictions that you're aware of? 318. Yeah, so section 318 relates to hate propaganda, which refers specifically to advocating for genocide. Which has happened. We've had cases in yeah. Canada where people have had advocated for genocide or people have denied the Holocaust, which I think is the kind same of, thing. Yeah. Um. And still that section has never been used. Um, There's section 319, which is the public incitement of hatred, um, which is like stirring up hatred in a public place. Um, And then there's section 434.1, and that's mischief relating to religious property, which specifically refers to mischief at churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, and any other place of worship. Um... Convictions under any of those sections of the act are very rare. Right. I have a couple of instances where they were used, but like 1985 and 1990 was the last time I could find that they were used. Yeah, and on the same guy for the same crime. Yeah. So... So this was for the conviction of Holocaust denier Jim Keekstra. He was out west in Alberta, and he he was convicted of section under section three nineteen. Nineteen eighty five. In nineteen eighty five, it was overturned, and then it was upheld by the Supreme Court in nineteen ninety. Um, and that case was a landmark because Friedman says it articulates the difference between dangerous speech, which is a crime, and offensive speech, which we have to tolerate it because it's not a crime. Right. Um, and so putting it into example that you remember water fountain do, uh, got pushed into the water fountain. Yeah. He had that side. If he had been holding it outside of a mosque, probably not a hate crime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, because I don't even know why it doesn't count as a hate crime. <clears throat> because it's not defined. That's why. Because it's not uh, dangerous speech. I think the problem is, is that like the sign whole... is like the sign, like if you say kill all Muslims, maybe that's a hate crime. If you're in public. In public versus little mosque on the prairie, two girls dead. Yeah. Right. Like there's very, it has to be very specific wording for the law to do anything about it. Well, and I think the thing too is, is that police are generally, um, like, for example, in Canada, we don't get a lot of attempted murder convictions. Mm-hmm. And the reason is because the way the section of the law is written mm-hmm. makes it very difficult to obtain a conviction. Same thing with these. 
the the criteria are so specific that unless those criteria are exactly met in the evidence, Mm -hmm. they're not going to bother. Yeah. And that's really unfortunate because, you know, anybody with a computer can look up the criminal code and then just make sure they, you know, don't dot their I and cross their T a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they can basically escape prosecution for these types of But even if they are prosecuted for it, like the... (sighs) The punishments are, they can't exceed two years. Yeah, two years incarceration. You know, like. Yeah. It's two years. So somebody could be like, oh, we should kill all the black people, which is advocating genocide. And then the most that they're going to get is two years. And that would only be in the most absolute worst scenario. Yeah. That's the other thing is that like the average conviction is going to be much less than that because they're not going to, it's not going to be the absolute worst scenario. Uh, and it's a very convoluted section of the act. I mean, not most of the criminal code of Canada is hard to read. <laughs> um, but this one is, is just so vague. Yeah. Which is frustrating, especially well, for somebody like me who has been, you know, the, the victim, survivor, whatever term mm-hmm. of something that is so obviously an assault motivated by racism that... Yeah, The police basically were like, I don't know what we can do for you. Well, and I mean, the other thing that kind of sucks about this is, so so there's this hole in the criminal code. Mm -hmm. um, But then in addition, you found that there are uh, sources of confusion because each of the provinces have human right codes where hateful acts may constitute an offense in regulated workplaces. But But then, like, they're protected, like, for if they have, like, for example, a religious text that says that, right? Oh, my Bible says this. Yeah, so So even, and and the other thing is, is that even if they're offenses under the Human Rights Code, they're not Mm -hmm. criminal offenses. No. So they don't, they don't count. Yeah. They can, you know, there are potential consequences. You could be fired, you could be censured. But it's not criminal. But there's no, yeah, it's not a criminal offense, so... You know, in a sense, it's it's there's no teeth. Yeah. To the to the statute. Yeah. So there has to be like a quote unquote regular crime yeah. committed for anything to happen, right? Yeah. Oh man. Um. So we have some statistics about hate crimes that have been reported to the police in Canada. Yep. Um. It's pretty high. And it got higher. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was interesting. To me, when I found these, and these are from the um, StatsCan, uh, so it's the government of Canada's mm-hmm. statistics uh, sort of centralized site. Yeah. So from 2009 to 2016, roughly speaking, you know, averaged about 1,400 a year. You know, there were a couple of years where it dropped a little bit, 2013, 2014, where it dropped about by 100 or whatever. And then 2017, it had jumped up to... 1,752. So it, it increased by about 350 mm-hmm. in the space of one year. And remember, these are only reported, reported crimes, right? Yeah. And so mine would count as a statistic. But they didn't do anything about it. Yeah. So. And and the thing is, is that if they, if you reported it, but they didn't create an incident report, mm-hmm. it wouldn't count as a statistic. Exactly. So like if. If you had that conversation and they get off the phone and they're just like, well, you don't, you know, they didn't give you an incident number or anything like that. Chances are it was unrecorded. Oh, fantastic. So. And see, I was in shock. I didn't know to ask for an incident number. Well, no, that's their, the responsibility of the police in a situation like this. They took my information. But... Yeah. Um, so hopefully that record exists. Yeah, I don't know. But again, it's, it's one of those, those, those those things where we just yeah we just don't know so there's an interesting paragraph on the sort of crunching of this this data so the fact that these these numbers are sort of going up and down a little bit and um i'm just going to read that here so police data on hate motivated crimes uh are also dependent on the willingness of victims to bring the incident to the attention of police and on the police services level of expertise in identifying crimes motivated by hate As with other crimes, self-reported data provide another way of monitoring hate-motivated crimes. 
According to the 2014 General Social Survey on Victimization, which measures eight types of crimes, Canadians self-reported that being uh, having been the victim of over 330,000 criminal incidents that they perceived as being motivated by hate. So think about that. 1,750 in, se- in t- 2017 reported to police, self-report 330,000. Hmm. Now, obviously... Um, it's not all sort of religious or racial or gendered Mm -hmm. crimes. You know, someone could just not like you and that could also qualify as a hate. Sort of, you know, they hate you so they, you know, beat you up or they hate you and so they robbed your house. But... I don't know who's using that definition of a crime. Yeah. So, so I think it was more like the survey wasn't really that... It didn't go into that? Yeah, it wasn't that specific. So, but if you think about that, 330,000, like even if you took 10% of that Mm. as being racialized or religious, that's still a lot. That's 33,000. Yeah, it's still 3,300. You said 10%, right? 30, yeah. Oh, wait, 33,000. Yeah. Geez, I like my math better. Yeah, so if you think about that, that's crazy. That is. And so it seems to me like there might be a pretty significant gap. Well, I mean, if somebody is the victim of a hate crime and they phone the police and they're like, I don't know what I can do for you. Yeah. Like. Why would they report? Yeah. Well, it actually says two thirds of these incidents is uh, two thirds of these incidents were not reported to police. And I mean, you're already the victim. You can't really you're not really in the mind space to fight the police. Yeah. For an incident number or to talk to somebody who might have more knowledge. Like you just. Yeah. Well, to advocate your, for yourself when you're a victim already yeah. is not something that's going to be easy. And then like I didn't have a handbook. That's, so you've been a victim of a hate crime handbook. So I didn't yeah. really know. They were the first people I went to, right? And exactly. So maybe that needs to be a thing. It's a sad handbook, but. Yeah. A checklist. Something like just these are the steps you should take, yeah. That's a good idea, yeah. Maybe we'll see if there's some sociology students that want to get on that. Ah, social justice lawyers. Well, I can't afford those guys, ah, they do it for free. <laughs> I'm gonna, f- they mostly work at clinics. Maybe get some law students. <laughs> there we go. That's I don't actually, I think I can afford them. No, no, they're free. Oh, good. <laughs> um. I know a few, actually. That's that's actually a really good idea. Yeah. We have all the great ideas on this podcast. Just none of the money to make it happen. Uh, uh, you know what? If there's a listener out there who knows how to do this. You want to do that? Do it and link it. Yeah. You won't get rich, but... We'll say thank you? The end. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, do you want me to talk a little bit about Toronto and the West? Yeah, sure. Go for it. So, um, the West. Yeah, the prairies. So, uh, in Toronto, um, 2017, the number of reported hate crimes jumped by 28% compared to 2016. And this is according to the Toronto Police Hate Crimes Unit. Uh, however, hey, where were they when I called? Oh, that's who you called. I didn't call. I just called the police. Oh, I thought you. I thought you'd gotten in touch with them, but I, guess I don't know. I just talked to somebody. Yeah. I must have told my story nine times. Yeah. So, and this is actually from an article from the CBC, um, and they indicated that the reason for that jump is maybe attributable to the fact that training has helped officers understand hate crimes better. Um, so, in other words. It's not that people are reporting more of them. It's, it's that, that police they're are just recognizing in... more of them on the police's end. Yeah. Well, I didn't say they're not doing anything good. I'm just saying they didn't help me. Yeah. And, and that's, that's something, you know, to make very clear, right? We're not police bashing here. We're just noting yeah. that there could be deficiencies between what's actually happening and what they're able to handle based on the law. Well, I mean, and that's where the real deficiency is. It's not within the police services. It's within the law for the police to be able to charge somebody with something. Yeah. Right? Like. Yeah, if there's no offense, their hands are tied. They can't do anything. 
So. I mean, that's just how it works. Yeah. So. Um, in addition to that, uh, in the prairies, so in the western part of the hey, country. Time out. I think we're really nice to the police on this podcast. We try to be. Yeah. I try to be fair. Yeah. In my case, not great. In other cases, getting better. Yep. So let's talk about the prairies, because we don't really shout out the prairies very much. This is not a, a happy shout out, though. Sorry, yeah. prairies. So in terms of the prairies, they, uh, in 2015, had the highest rise in hate crimes in Canada, uh, according they to... They also have the longest history of hate groups, too, though. Yeah, you did quite a bit of research on that, but... Yeah, we'll have to do another episode about hate groups in Canada, but the Ku Klux Klan was all over that place in the 20s. Yeah. So, I well, mean, and basically it's not that surprising. Yeah, they've had they've had sort of, uh, what do you call it? Um, they've created offshoots mm-hmm. every sort of decade since. Yeah. Um, there's a very active... I mean, and populations are growing out there, Yeah. right? Because there's space... And you could actually afford a house out there. I yeah. mean, don't stay in Ontario. Yeah. Can't um, afford to live. But the targets the targets out west are predominantly about the sort of religion race. It's the brown Muslim people and Jewish communities that are the primary targets yeah. of the hate groups out there. Right. Um, and I would argue the hate groups here, let's be honest. Yeah, I mean, it, it always comes back to the same thing. If you're other, yeah, um, it's going to be that. That's unfortunately what these these individuals attack. I like that we keep calling them people. We're taking the high road. Yes. Well, you know. I mean, so hate crimes. It's not sh- not really great laws to back you up. Yeah, I think that... Not that, very great services to back you up. Well, I think this is something that, that could be addressed fairly easily. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, an amendment to the criminal code, uh, identifying specifically, you know, what a hate crime is, and, um, you know, sort of giving giving police power to not just investigate, but also charge. Yeah. Based but there on, has to be a change in that criminal code, because crimes are evolving, Absolutely. Right? And so... Online and off. So we need to evolve with those crimes. <laughs> like, yeah. with the code. And I know it's a lot to change the law. But, I mean, it's got to be done, right? Like, Yeah. And you know what? That's actually something... Nobody should call the police and the police should say, I don't know what we can do for you. That yeah. should never be something the police say to somebody that's been victimized. Absolutely not. Um, but I really do think that there needs to be a checklist. And I'm going to research for one. And if not... I'm going to call some people because that needs to be done. Yeah. Just might have to revisit that issue. I think we should. Because that's a really good idea. Yeah. You know, the rule is if it's a good idea, it's probably already out there. Well, I hope so, but... Me too. We might be the ones who come up with it. I don't know. Well, Let's you find heard out. it here. <laughs> patent pending. <laughs> what kind of patent is that? Somebody make it. I'll be happy. Yeah, I think it would be a copyright. So... Well, thanks for the conversation. Not very uplifting, I guess. Cathartic? I think that if somebody is the victim of a, of a hate crime, that they should still report it. Yeah. Um, as difficult as it, get your support system, go and report it. Um, because there are way more crimes happening than being reported, for sure. Oh, absolutely. And there's not going to be any change if... Unfortunately, if there's not any statistics to back up that, we need that change. Yeah. So, I mean, as hard as it is, um, I'm still glad that I told the police, right? Like, as stressful and as shaming as it felt. Yeah. Um, I do think it was reported. They did take all my information, but... Yeah. Well, I I, again, like, yeah, I was... I was kind of operating, you know, at the end of a phone, right? So yeah. I don't, and I don't have a, a clear recollection of every sort of thing. I so. don't either, right? So, I mean, I don't know. But I, I think that people should report those things. Yep. So, okay. So, two things. So, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Get some support. And there are way more organizations now that will that have your back. Yeah, that's true. Support people and whatnot you can so, take with you. And I'll make sure to put some of those on the blog as well. Okay. So thanks for the chat, Don.
Oh, you're very welcome. Just because the podcast is over doesn't mean the conversation has to stop. We would love to hear your comments, reflections, and questions. Visit us at our blog, imcpodcast.blogspot.com, or tweet to us at imcpodcast. If you're a Facebook user, we have a page there too, at facebook.com slash imcpodcast. New episodes upload every Sunday. Our theme song is called Righteous Fight by Angara. Thanks for listening. See you next week.